everyone. It's me. <laughs> I'm sick. Um, I am feeling a lot better today. Um, I received some emails from you guys. Thank you for your concern. That was very sweet. Um, like I mentioned in my um, uh, announcement, you know, my, my oncologist re recently kind of made some major changes to my um, medication regimen and it just threw everything off and it's um, feels like I have a cold like a bad cold but it's just it's just the side effects so um, there's they should be adjusting I'm, we're hoping uh, you know if if I don't start feeling better in the next couple of days then we might have to go back to the old medication but like not to get too involved into like my personal medical stuff but obviously we made the change to this medication for a reason and so it's like a whole thing and so you know i don't know i feel like shit um my body hurts and my joints hurt and i'm really really tired um like it feels like i've had a really long week of just like you know when you know that feeling when you're like really run down but i haven't done anything so um hmm. I have a little, okay, I'm gonna try to get through this. I had a little bit of energy, and so I had enough energy this morning to like actually get up and like make a little food and um, get a shower. <laughs> and you know, I'm like, okay, I've got some energy, I'll have some coffee, and then um, I, I, can, I can sit in front of the camera and talk for a bit, so, <sighs> okay. So we're, this is the PowerPoint or this is a lecture for phylogeny and cladistics. Now you might be thinking those words sound really fancy and sciencey, and uh, it's true. And while this this section in general, I think people, my students in the past, have been like, "What's what's she doing with? What are you doing? What are you looking for? She's looking for something. What's up? No, she's just being silly." Though. Probably, we haven't been outside a lot. Like, I want to see the sunshine because we've just been on the couch all day, all week. Okay, anyway. Okay, so by logic and cladistics. Um, th this is a little drier than some of the stuff for this class. Like, it, it's a, like naming and categorizing. And now, look at her. She's got all this energy. What's she doing? <laughs> she's got to be the star. She's got to be the star of the video. Wow, well, everyone's looking at you. Okay, um, but I'll try to, like I said, I'll try to make this as interesting as I can. I find it interesting because I enjoy like organizing and categorizing, I think. But for most people that are like, that's like the boring part of science. I think it's interesting. Anyway, okay, so we're gonna get through some of this. Like I said, I'm trying to make it interesting for you. Um, okay, so slide, so this is the phylogeny and cladistics, we're on slide two. So uh, classification, <clears throat> I mean, that's really what we're talking about, phylogeny and cladistics. Basically, it's like name, naming, organizing, categorizing, classifying, like all that stuff. So this is kind of a dated example. I don't even know, like, so this is from a show called Being Human. If, I think that's the name of the show. Like, I watched it about like a decade ago, but I used this last semester. My students were like, who were those people? So if, you, if you've never seen that show, like, that's why I used it, because it's like the human, because this show is called Being Human. I, anyway, it's a good show. It was like on sci-fi, but... I might need to update that example because people I, I think are like, who are those people on that photo? <laughs> anyway, okay. Um, so this is just the classification for humans, for homo sapiens. And the point of this is to show you, like most of us are familiar with this idea, like kingdom, phylum, clap, like the whole thing, right? Um, but it's that last two, the genus and species, that's the most important. So that binomial nomenclature, you go to slide, three you'll see that so typically when we're talking about a specific species for the scientific name we give the genus and the species name she's just screwing up the whole video look i don't want any natural sunlight waffle what are you doing she just went out i know she doesn't have to go out what's, what's up baby you want to be in the video okay come here you want you want some attention huh you want attention there you go who's that that's you that's you I'll hold it for a second. Okay. Um, oh, you're too cute, huh? You're too cute. So, oh, like I said, so binomial nomenclature. So it's using the, the genus name and the species name. So here you have the example of like scientific name versus common name. So for humans, 
the common name we would, we would say humans, right? But the scientific name would be Homo sapien. And so like for, for chimpanzees, chimpanzee would be the common name versus the scientific name would be Pan troglodytes. So it's that genus and the species. So f for the most part, like most of us know the common names of like animals, right? The names we use every day. Like we wouldn't necessarily know the scientific name, but sometimes, I, sometimes people know certain ones like, you know, but obviously in terms of like the scientific process, scientific method, doing research, you would want to use that to be, to be more specific. I uh, don't know. Okay. My hair got caught in my shoe. This video is crazy, you guys. Like, it's only like six minutes and I feel like so many weird things have happened. I'm not starting over. I, I do not have the energy to start over. Okay. <sighs> Slide four. But then there's this question, well, what is a species? So if we're, like if we took all of animals and we said, okay, and I asked you, like say I asked you, here are all the animals in the world, start organizing them. It would be really easy at first. You're like, okay, we're gonna do, you know, those with the spinal cord and those without a spinal cord, okay. Um, you know, those that um, have an exoskeleton versus, you know, an internal skeleton, okay, like, like, so they're like kind of major, larger things. You're like, oh, I can definitely separate these groups. This, or even like, okay, those, um, starting getting more and more specific, you can say even like, okay, those who lay eggs versus those who gestate, like, you know, like, okay, larger ideas, but when you start getting so the more and more, like getting more and more specific, it, it becomes harder. Like if I ask you like what classifies a mammal, you'd probably be able to give me a list of things like, oh, a mammal is this and that, and here are some species that are considered mammals. But if I asked you, you know, like what are something that characterizes a primate or what's something that characterizes homo sapiens versus other apes, it's like, it starts getting a little more complicated if you're not an expert, obviously. But even when you are, there's still this question of, what is a species? When we get down to that specific idea, what is a species? Because, you know, this idea of naming and classifying, this is a human endeavor to look at nature and be like, we need to put everything in a little box and name it, categorize it, put a name tag on it, and that's just not really how it works. Now, we can kind of sort of do that because nature, like, there is a process to nature. So we can say, okay, here's what's happening, and these are these animals are like this, and these animals are like this, and, and so we can kind of categorize them in general terms in this way. But when we start getting more and more specific, like we want to do that for our, our own human minds. Like we need to give everything a label and everything has to be separated very distinctly from each other. And that's just not really how nature works. We can still sort of do this. And, but the idea of a species is a little more complicated. In fact, um, there's not just one idea of how we would even define that term a species. So if I ask you like, how do you define that term? Like what is a species? Like what constitute one species versus another like how do you can you tell the difference between one species and another species like if you were looking at two different species how would you tell the difference like what like what are the defining characteristics what are the what are the factors the distinguishing factors that you have to have and most of you would probably adhere to something called and you can see this on slide four something called the biological species concept but this is only one idea there are actually i have three on this powerpoint but there are literally like 50 you know depending on which which one you adhere to most Biological scientists would say biological species concept is the one that seems to be work the best. It has the, it seems to be kind of how nature kind of naturally works, but there are always going to be exceptions to in, like we've, I've said before in anything in nature, nothing is 100%. There will always be the occasional outlier, the exception to the rule. It doesn't mean the rule doesn't apply. It doesn't mean the rule isn't true. It just means that nature is complicated and nothing is ever 100%. Um, so we're going to go through these. So if you go to slide five, I have some more details on the biological species concept. Like I said, this is the one when, when you think of species, this is probably the concept you are imagining in your mind without even knowing that it had a name. So this is a group of actually or potentially interbreeding individuals um, within a population um, that are reproductively isolated. So basically what it's saying is that a a species, according to this idea, a concept of a species, a species is a species because it cannot inter, it can only interbreed with others in its own species. It can, if it can't, it can't interbreed, it can't produce offspring with something from a different species. That's how we would define, like, we'd say, okay, that's the line. So, like, a, you know, um, a cat and a dog can't produce offspring, so they're not the same species. Um, a human and a uh, 
capuchin monkey can't produce offspring, so they're not the same species. So we were like, yeah, this is probably what we think of. Like, if they could produce with each other, they probably we consider them the same species, you know. But as you're probably thinking in your mind, wait a minute, like that makes sense 99.9% .9 of the time, but there are a couple of exceptions to that. So like a uh, lion and a tiger, we would not consider them the same species like at all. We know that they're like closely related, but they're not the same species at all, but we know that they can produce offspring, viable offspring. Now in nature, it doesn't really happen. I think as far as I know, the only cases of this happening are like when, it, when they're in captivity. So that kind of speaks to something like in a natural state, it might not be something they would naturally maybe consider each other species or a, like a, the member of the same species, but it can still happen. Um, and then what's a horse, horse and a donkey produce a mule. A mule is, cannot reproduce anymore, but a lion, a tiger, like I, I have to think about it. I think I want to say if it's like the tigers, the female, they can, the, it's not, the offspring isn't sterile. I'd have to like double check on that one. Um, but like I said, it doesn't really happen in nature. So like there are a couple of exceptions to this. Oh, there's another one. Zebra. <laughs> oh God, you guys. Okay, I just found this out recently. A zebra and a donkey. Um, please take a moment. I should have put this in the PowerPoint on that because I just, I just found this out a couple days ago. Please take a moment to Google what do you call when you combine a zebra and a donkey, there are some really great names for this. But it's because, so this is what I'm trying to get at though. But no, like on a side note, please do that. It's hilarious. However, um, we have exceptions to the rule. We would never say a donkey and a zebra are the same. We know like they're completely distinct species, but sometimes in captivity in like an unnatural sense or a natural circumstance, they can reproduce. Um, so it's not always that there's a reproductive barrier. It, you know, sometimes it's something else. So exceptions to the rule, a few, not not many, a few, uh, absolutely. But we would still consider this kind of like, this is how we would define a species, like that they can't reproduce with each other. Okay, so go on to slide six. So another one is the recognition species concept. So this one is kind of saying, a species, a member of the same species is, is anything that a, an individual of that species is saying, I can potentially mate with you. So for those who, are, who would say this is the, the correct one if you're mating with someone then they're clearly in your same species then they would they would probably make the argument then that um lions and tigers are the same species because they can interbreed and they do recognize each other on occasion you could go back and forth in this argument like they only recognize each other because of like extenuating circumstances like you know but it's it's a point of interest it's a point of discussion for sure like they can't technically interbreed they sometimes do yeah, the circumstances have to be very particular. So in a natural state, it might not happen, but it can still happen. This one is like, she is just like asleep in my arms. Poor baby. Probably knows I don't feel good, okay. Slide seven, um, ecological species concept. So this is when, um, it's not even based on anything reproductive, that those who adhere to this concept kind of recognize that there are environmental factors that might be more important than like the reproductive factors in terms of defining a species. So they would say, um, if there is a group that has a particular ecological niche, um, typically if you're thinking of like a food resource, um, that if they're, if they're adapted to that specific ecological niche, whatever it is, then that that's the the um, how you would define them as a species. It doesn't matter if they can interbreed or not interbreed with another group. That that that's what separates them. So like finches are a really good example of this because many of the finches, like the species or subspecies, can interbreed. Um, some can, some can't. And but they have very specific adaptations to like certain food resources. So those so those who would adhere to this concept would say. Well, it's those things that really separate them, whether they interbreed or not. There's something else going on environmentally, ecologically, that's kind of separating them from each other, and that's more important. So like I said, this idea can get a little more complicated when you're like, there are so many different ways of kind of looking at what a species is, and I've only listed three, and there are many, many more, trust me. Okay. <clears throat> um, so, slide eight, what about speciation? So how, this is the question, how do new species form? Because if we're talking about evolution, I, at some point we will see new species so there are two ways of kind of imagining this anagenesis and cladogenesis so here's a picture of it 
So anagenesis is where you have like one species, let's say, and then over time, because the environment might change, you see over time slowly a new species emerges from that original species, you know, um, one kind of evolving into a new one over a long period of time. Versus cladogenesis is when you have like a branching event. So you might have one species and then because of, you know, like an ecological factor or geographical factor, that species goes kind of into two groups and, you know, split or one kind of branches off from the, from the main and over time you have them kind of evolving into slightly different trajectories. So this is like, so think of like humans and chimpanzees. This would be an example of cladogenesis. Like we have, we share a common ancestor with them, but we went on our own separate evolutionary trajectories. But if you're thinking of like those in our lineage, which we'll talk about in this class a little later, but if you're already kind of aware, you might be thinking, well, what about, you know, like Homo erectus kind of slowly evolving into Heidelbergensis. Um, but, but then it gets even more complicated because sometimes you have a species where one part of the population evolves into something else and then the other population that like it's, oh, it's so complicated. It's so complicated, but we'll get into some of this, some of the hominin stuff later, but um but just so you know, so you can imagine like in general, these two, like one kind of slowly evolving into something new and then where there's branching events and both happen, one's not right or wrong. Like they're, they're both types that, that occur in, in nature. Um, slide nine. So why do new species form? So we know that they do, we know there's an evolutionary process. We know that there are five forces to evolution, um, but then we can kind of get into these more complex questions of why is this happening and how do we kind of define those different types of why? So here we have geographic isolation or what's called allopatric speciation or um, sympatric speciation. So where there's like a different adaptive niche. Um, and so this is kind of looking at, this isn't every single type, but this is like many. So if you have, and I think there's a, there's a picture. Yeah, so on slide 10, you see kind of a picture of looking at like trees as you know, these two types, so allopatric speciation. So if you're looking at um, the trees, you see that, um, oh, why, why does this picture look weird to me? Yeah, okay, that's right. Okay, so um, allopatric, you have the, the trees and that's something there's like a river, a geographical barrier, and because there's, they can't interbreed with each other, whether it's trees or frogs or humans or whatever, they just, you know, those two different species kind of evolve in their own, I'm sorry, those two different populations evolve in their own slightly different trajectories and eventually they become separate species from each other. Or sympatric, where they're still in the same area, but because of some kind of, you know, maybe they're eating, a, so if we're talking about like frogs or humans or something, if you're eating a different food resource, you might become adapted, so you have a different adaptive niche. Um, because of that. So this is like with the finches, you know, like that they might become separate species because they're becoming, oh, you're gonna get down? Okay, she's done. She's like, I'm done looking at this lecture. Okay. So those two types, okay. Uh, slide 11, taxonomy and phylogeny. So in case you weren't sure of those terms, taxonomy, sites of classifying and naming. And phylogeny is looking at those evolutionary relationships. So like a whole obviously related ideas um, and so if I asked you you know take so even this question I asked before like imagine I asked you like here are all the animals in the world start to organize them classify them rank them in some way name them based on that you know categorization and relationships you would start to do all that what would be the, one of the first things you would look at? And I already kind of said it earlier, you just probably start to look at those, how they look. Like you're gonna base it on probably, at least initially, physical phenotypic similarities. Like, okay, these probably, these, these species belong together and these ones belong together because they look similar. They have similar, you know, phenotypes, which makes sense. Obviously you can probably already imagine though that that's not always gonna work. Um, now you already have a lot of information, right? But imagine you've never seen any animal in the world. Like you'd be like, I don't know, you know, but okay. So go to slide 12. There are two different types of traits, analogous and homologous. So analogous traits are when we see that they are shared because like when two different species have a similar trait because they have a similar adaptation that causes them to have a similar trait. Um, we also sometimes refer to this as like convergent evolution. 
And then in contrast, we have homologous traits. These are traits that animals might share with each other because they actually are closely related. If I have an example, let's go to slide 13. You'll see an example of analogous traits. Um, so wings, so you might, if you didn't know any better, you might say, okay, all of those animals who have wings are probably in the same, you know, family or order. We know that's completely wrong because if we're, well, one, if we're looking at like insects, or, you know, birds and mammals, like all different. But even if you're just taking a bat and a bird as an example, um, not even, not even closely related at all. In fact, a, a, a bat is a mammal. And even if you look at the structure, as you can see in this picture, the structure of the wing is actually even quite different. Now they both have wings because at some point in their ancestry, you know, the evolutionary process was occurring and, and being able to fly obviously had a very beneficial effect. And so we see it kind of emerging um, in different, you know, populations multiple times. Uh, so like I said, we call this convergent evolution. Uh, but it's they don't have that trait because they are really closely related and like one passes to the next. That's not what's happening. So that's what we see with in slide four, slide fourteen. Homologous traits. So if we look at the opposable thumbs of humans and the opposable thumbs of chimps or gorilla, like we all have that same trait because we have an ans we share an ancestry. Like we have it be because our ancestor had it. Like it's been passed down. Like that's why we all have it. We all share that trait. It's not like we all separately, independently, were like evolved opposable thumbs. No, we, we all have that trait because we, our, the common ancestor had it. Okay. So, some more on primate. Primate. I'm tired already. I've been talking for what, 20 minutes? Okay. We're like halfway through this. Halfway, okay. We can, I can do it, okay. Um, hmm. Primate taxonomy, slide 15. Okay, so what are traits that all primates share? So in terms of like physical traits first. Um, like I've already said before, so we have grasping hands or opposable thumbs, so we can, you know, not only can we grab things like, you know, something like a bat, let's say, you know, but we can also very finely, like, you know, do precision grips with like a pencil and stuff like that, a needle, you know, we can do a lot with our hands. It's not just like we can, you know, grab big things, we can grab tiny things too. There's a lot of things we can do because there's a lot of ways we can manipulate our environment because of the fact that we have opposable thumbs and we can do things with our hand. So there's this joke, like if cats had opposable thumbs, like they would take over the world, you know, like, once you have that ability to manipulate your environment without using your face, so a lot of other animals, like when you ask a dog to do something, like, go get that toy, it doesn't use its paw, it uses its mouth, right? When you suddenly, as an animal, stop doing that and start ha using a limb in some way, it completely changes um, so many things about your soul. In fact, a tangent now, elephants. I know we've talked about elephants, I think, very briefly in this class before. Um, but elephants, you know, because they have a trunk, they essentially have a limb that they use to manipulate the environment in, in some amazing ways. And elephants are highly intelligent. It, 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 drastic, when, it drastically changes your social interactions and that way you, when you start being able to manipulate your environment with a limb in some way. So I, will, I think I'll probably touch on that a little more later in another PowerPoint, but just it's very interesting. Okay, so... We also have more of an emphasis on vision. This is in contrast to an emphasis on smell, which is why we don't have a lot of prognathism. We're not that projecting snout. We don't have that. Like we see, like think of your dog, for example, they have a wet nose or a rhinarium. They have a lot of emphasis on smell, not on vision. So like our, the bony structure around our eyes too. So like, um, repeating myself, I didn't tell you guys this already, did I? I don't think so, okay. So like, if you feel around your own base, you're like, I have bone this whole way, right? But if you feel it on that same location on your dog, it's like there's no bone right here. It's just you, you poke through. Like it's just like, you know, a little muscle. You can poke their eyeball. But primates, we have bony structure on the whole thing, on the sides, in the back, for the most part. Like it's very, a lot of protection around the eyes because of that. And we don't really have that same, you know, um, system in our nose that dogs have for example like their sense of smell is something was it like 
700 times or something crazy, right? But if you ever walk your dog, you'll see them sniffing everything. They're getting all of their social information like, oh, a female, a male, a puppy, an older dog, uh, that may be a potential mate, maybe not, like whatever it is, you know. Um, and they smell everything like, I'll, I'll be in the kitchen and I'll be trying to be hella quiet. And I'm like, okay, you know, like <laughs> hearing too, right? Most of you have dogs or even cats probably, you know, like you're like trying to be so quiet with like the snack that you want for yourself. And you're like, there's no way they can hear me. You, I'll even like, you know, turn the dryer on, like in the next room, like, oh, I'll make the noise, you know, I'm like the tiniest, like, and they come running, like, how do they know? And not even that, but like, I'll have a similar wrapper for something else that they hate, and they won't, like, they know. That's like, they can, it's like that, I don't know what it is, they're so smart with their, with their ears and the smell, like, I'll come in with groceries, and if I have something special in there for them, like, they're, like, they know, they, they know, I don't tell them, like, they're really, but the humans are like, I don't know, you know, it's not the same, like, but visually, we can see vision is very important for primates. Um, nails rather than claws, so if you look at that picture of the chimpanzee, you'll see. Um, you'll see that they have the nails just like you do you know we don't have claws like think of like your dog your cat they have a completely different type of um, hand in that sense um, I already said this before closed eye orbits reduction in cell clavicles we're not the only group that has clavicles but it's just an interesting thing. We're, we're one of few that actually has this bone right here the clavicle um, and reduction in snout so Primates compared to non-primates, we tend to have, especially like humans and those more closely related to us, like even flatter, flatter faces than like most other animals. So imagine like your dog, very large, basically their whole face is here versus with primates, it tends to not be as projecting as much. And then for like humans and other apes, it's like fairly flat. But there are also some behavioral traits that we all share as primates. So number 16, and some of these are kind of true for mammals, but some of them are, more, are even more so true for primates. So usually we have a single offspring. We call this a singleton. So like when you think of a human, for example, most of the time when a human female is pregnant, it's one at a time. On occasion, of course, they might have twins or even rare, more rare than that, they'll have, you know, like three, four. That, but that's not the normal, like at all, right? That's like the exception. It very rarely happens. Um, it's almost always one at a time. Um, this is true for all primates. Um, there's an exception. I, I want to say it's like tamarins. It's like a small New World monkey. Like because of their social systems, but different. That for them, it's more common to have twins. So um, we have extended juvenile periods. So think about just humans, because we have ours is of course like even more extreme. Um, so think about how long does it take for a human to be able to walk I don't know I don't have kids but it's not like days right it's not weeks I'm gonna make a random I should I should have googled it actually I got my phone let's google this right now because I should know this I want to guess and say it's probably like what like walking I would guess like a year I don't know um when do babies walk When do babies start walking? Here we go. For babies will likely take their first steps between nine and 15 months. Oh, so I said a year, so that's like perfect. Okay, okay, that was a good guess, Alicia. Okay. Um, okay, so a year, a year um, to begin to walk, but think about other animals. Like when can they start walking? The same day they're born? A couple days, maybe a week, depending on the animal. It depends on the animal, right? But like very quickly humans we are completely helpless um, there are a couple different reasons for that but for this conversation in terms of us being primates let's just stick with that because if you look at other primates it's the same as well very helpless for a long time mothers have to carry them for a long time now humans are a little more extreme it takes us you know, quite a quite quite a bit longer um, but, Mm, this is still true for primates. 
that's going to take them a long time. We're, we're highly dependent on, on, the, on our mothers. Bumble one, as mammals, this makes total sense because we are literally, for an extended period of time, attached to our mothers for food. Um, but even after that, so this is true for, for, for a lot of mammals, but primates even more so, like I said. There's a very strong mother-infant bond. And there's a very strong dependence on learned behavior. So for prime, and this is true for a lot of other animals, um, like we talked about, you know, like pigs or elephants or dolphins this is true, but for primates specifically, it's true for m almost all primates that there is a dependence on learned behavior. There are things that are not instinctual. There are things that they have to learn from their parents or others in their communities about like the environment in very specific ways that they wouldn't know instinctually. So there's an emphasis on this amount of learned behavior. And there's a lot of debate in anthropology about whether this idea of there being a lot of behavior you have to learn and there being an extended period of being a juvenile are related because it seems as if like commonsensically like of course like that's why we're juveniles for longer periods more dependent because we need more time to learn really important vital information but i'll just tell you like there's a lot of debate about whether that's actually true or not so many other interesting factors going into that um so it's just interesting but we do know that those are things that definitely categorize us or, or characterize char characterize us why does that sound weird you guys know what i'm saying okay Okay, slide 17. Which traits are most important for classification? Okay, so for classifying, there are, there are a few different ways, but there are kind of two main ways that I'll talk to you guys about and, and pros and cons to both and just different ways that it's done. So the first one, um, so right here I have two approaches. The first one is called cladistics. Um, so here you have a picture of what's called a cladogram. Um, cladistics, it's very important, like for cladistics, for cladists, and I would, I would classify myself, I would say, I would identify myself as a cladist. I think that there is, going with the pros and cons, I feel like this is definitely the way that makes the most sense um, in terms of how we're going to classify different species and, and understand these uh, evolutionary relationships. But for a cladist, there are certain things that are more important than other things, like there's something we refer to as called like the parsimony rule, or if you ever heard of like Occam's razor, like the simplest explanation is probably the correct one. So when you're looking at, like say you had a bunch of animals, you're like trying to figure out that how they're related and you're looking at all these different traits, what, what are the fewest steps to get to, you know, these, you know, if you were unclear on this, you know, what are the fewest steps to get from this one to this one to this one to this one? Whatever the simplest explanation is in terms of if you have like 10 species and you're trying to figure out which one's related to who and how and when, the simplest explanation is probably the most, is probably the correct one. And so that kind of guides a lot of how we understand the evolutionary relationships. But time isn't necessarily, like, especially like looking at the cladogram, it's not even really about, time's not, not important in terms of like understanding and classifying. Um, and in terms of like speciation too, and this is where it's kind of hard for me, like I get them, because you know, I'm getting so far off topic, um, or I was about to at least. The cladogenesis is really important because cladus would say that's the only time you really know you have a new species is when you have a branching event. Because when you have kind of an anagenesis event, like one to the next, maybe slowly, how, where do you decide there's a cutoff? Because what if it's all kind of just one species and variation within that species? And if it's two, like how long do they have to extend and where's the cutoff point? They would say, you can't with your human bias determine that and nature isn't really determining it either, so why bother? But when you have a branching event, when you have cladogenesis and a clear derived trait and a completely new evolutionary trajectory in terms of like a new, like say bipedalism for example, clearly new derived trait that's happened, completely different evolutionary trajectory from the quadrupedalism from before, that's when you can say, okay, new species, new line. So um, this is in contrast to, so slide 18, what's called evolutionary taxonomy, where um, those longer evolutionary lineage, lineages are important. So looking at anagenesis and cladogenesis, the ancestral traits are really important versus, you know, for cladistics, it's the derived traits that are most important. And time is also really important. So you can hear, you can see this evolutionary tree we're just taking more information into account. Neither one of these is wrong. There's not one right way or one wrong way. They're just kind of 
different ways. And there's similarities, obviously overlap, but there's similarities in looking at, um, or there's, um, they're just different ways of kind of looking at the same problem. And, and you most, oh my God, I'm so tired. Different scientists will, will use one over the other, you know. But you'll find, and this is where it comes up, every once in a while, there's gonna be a disagreement about this. Um, so one slide, why didn't I, I'm, I'm, I'm cold. I don't want my AC kicked on. Give me one second. I'm sitting here like in a sweatshirt. My AC kicked on, okay. So go to slide 19 and you'll see uh, that if we're looking at primates and we use these two different types, that it can be problematic because whether you're a cladist or an evolutionary taxonomist, you might organize and name primates ever so slightly differently. Oh my God, that was that was a sentence. Hopefully that made sense to you guys. Okay, we're gonna get through it. Okay, so if we're using the cladistics approach, if you're a cladist, you would say, okay, here, here are all the primates. I can see right off the bat that there are kind of two categories like a, a suborder, and I'm gonna call those the strepsirenes and the haplorenes, okay? If you're an evolutionary taxonomist, you might say, I agree, looking at all of primates kind of right away. I can say, before I even get down to the specifics of the species, I can already say there's kind of two groups. I agree with you, Cletus, there are two groups, but I'm gonna name them the prosimians and the anthropoids. So, so far, you're like, okay, both, whichever one you adhere to, both are kind of recognizing that right away. There are kind of two groups within primates. You can already outright separate them into two groups, slightly different names. And for the most part, they even agree on the separation. But there is an except, there's one little exception that they disagree on. This is what I wanted to get at, that sometimes this way of organizing and classifying can and often does have the occasional issue. So. For Cletus, they would say, okay, strepsirenes and haplorenes, strepsirenes are the lemurs and the lorises, and haplorenes are everything else, all the other primates. They would say lemurs and lorises clearly are a little more ancestral in some of their features. They're clearly primates, but they definitely have, are kind of their own group, their suborder within larger order of primates. Evolutionary taxonomists would say, I agree with you, lemurs and lorises are a little more ancestral, and they do belong in their own subgroup, suborder, but Evolutionary taxonomists would also say, and included with lemurs and lorises, are the group called the tarsiers. They also belong with. Cletus would say, no, no. Tarsiers don't belong with lemurs and lorises. They belong with the rest of us. They belong with monkeys and, and apes, including humans. And so it's the tarsier. And, we're, and I'm going to show you some pictures. You're going to be like, I don't, I don't understand. Okay. So go to slide 20. So evolutionary taxonomists, this is just another visual to show you. Evolutionary taxonomists would say prosimians include lemurs, lorises, and tarsiers, and anthropoids include new world monkeys, old world monkeys, and apes. And slide 20, cladist approach, they would say strepsirenes and haplorenes, and strepsirenes would be lemurs and lorises, and haplorenes would be monkeys, apes, and tarsiers. So it's the tarsier, just, I'm just clarifying, it's the tarsier. That's the odd one out. Now, if you look now real quick in this picture right here on slide 21, that's a loris. And go back to slide 20, we've got a, a lemur and another lemur. So those are primates, but they definitely look, what we could say, more ancestral. They're probably more similar to the first primates. They are nocturnal, they tend to eat insects. They do have a little more emphasis on smell than the rest of the primates. So there are some definitely like clear ancestral features. And go to slide 22, sorry. And that's what a tarsier looks like. Now you might be thinking, I think I agree with the evolutionary taxonomist on this one. The tarsier clearly is looks, looks more similar to lemurs and lorises. It's nocturnal. You can look at those eyes. It has similar structure in the eyes because it's nocturnal, like the lemurs and the lorises. It's small, like the lemurs and the lorises. It's an insectivore, like the lemurs and the lorises. Okay, Cletus, like why do you think it doesn't belong with them? And Cletus would say, because of those derived features that it has. Yes, it has some similar ancestral features with lemurs and lorises, but here, and here it has right here. They do not have a rhinarium, so they don't have a wet nose. 
they have full orbital closure. So I told you primates, we have full bony closure around here and in the back, but lemurs and lorises don't have it fully in the back. They only have it on the side. So it's more of an ancestral feature to not have it in the back, the bony, I think, I think I might have a picture in a second of actually showing the bone. Um, and the tarsiers do have that full bony closure. And also their placenta is more similar to monkeys and, and, and um, apes. So platists would say, yes, I agree that they do have some ancestral features, but these derived features really place them as being kind of a separate thing. And so you get this slightly different understanding of how to organize and classify primates. There's no major like disagreement in terms of like, most people, when you say prosimian, most people understand what you mean. You mean nocturnal, insectivore, small, emphasis on smell probably. And whether you include, whether you think a tarsier is a, is a prosimian or whether you think it's a uh, uh, haplorine, um, I have to think about that for a second. Um, Typically, depending on what you're talking about, people won't understand the difference. But just understand that if you would just on visuals alone, you'd be like, well, it's tiny little insect nocturnal insectivore must be must be prosimian. And we're like, well, when you really start looking at those derived features, it's clearly kind of separate from those. So just understand, like, it can get a little complicated. Okay, so let's talk about the strepsorines and the haplorines from the cladist approach. I told you that I would classify myself, or I would definitely identify as a cladist in terms of pros and cons I feel like there are some better um, it's more useful in a lot of different ways okay so here we have the um, strepsorines lemurs and the lorises um, so they share these specific features so we're on slide 23 um, sharp cusped molars so remember we talked about this that for primates if you want to know what we are eating you have to look at the back teeth the molars and the premolars, the back teeth. So for lemurs and lorises, they tend to all be insectivores, which means they mostly, the majority of their diet are insects with obviously the occasional plant or fruit item. Um, but they are adapted in their molars to eat those crunchy insects. They have a wet nose or called a rhinarium, like your dog. So lemurs and lorises have this. They still have that ancestral condition of a really great adaptation to scent is really important to them socially still so that's interesting they have this isn't really important but they have an unfused mandible so for our mandible like in adulthood it's it's one bone for us um, developmentally it's like two but for them like even in adulthood there's still like a clear like separation there's like a, a suture line so it's interesting they have what's called a tooth comb and I think I have a picture of this later I think I have a picture of the tooth comb later. Oh, I say that and it's probably not gonna be, okay. But basically imagine that their front inside it and they kind of jet straight out and it serves a few different purposes. I'm not gonna go into that now because I think I talk about it later maybe, but just it's a defining feature of their teeth. The post orbital bar. So like I said, they do have the bone here, the bar, but they don't have that full enclosure in the back. And I do have a picture coming up of that in a second. And they're nocturnal, which means they're active at night to be active at night okay so slide 24 and you can see this difference between the one on the left is is a um probably a lemur um you can see there's bony bone around the whole eye on the side but the back they're still like exposed a little bit there's not a full bony closure in the back versus if you look right there at the one on the right that's like a baboon or a macaque or something full bony closure on the sides and in the back of the eye orbit so slight difference there and slide 25, you'll see some beautiful examples of lemurs. If you probably most of you are familiar with like the ring tailed, ring -tailed lemur, um, a couple other examples, um, the red ruffed lemur. And if you go to slide 26, the loris is, oh, oh yeah. um, the slow loris, and I don't know the other one, the cutie patootie loris. <laughs> I don't know, they're so cute, right? Unfortunately, though, if you, and you'll see this often in like, um, tourist videos and people like holding a lord like like you'll see them looking all cute in reality they're scared um, you know often what happens is so unfortunate that these animals are kept awake during the day which is 
um, not natural to them. And, you know, it's not also not natural to be around humans all the time, being petted and held. And they're also defenseless, so they often look like they're just being cute and they're really just terrified. And so while I think it's natural for any of us to like, you wanna hold and pet something cute and you wanna love it. Um, if you are ever traveling and someone's like, wanna hold this Loris? Like, just say no. Like, I know you might not think like you as one person in the world might not be able to make a difference, but you know, you can try. And um, so when you see this, like, um, this isn't the case all the time, but this is the case enough to where I felt like I needed to say something, so. Just be cognizant of that. Um, okay, so slide 27. So then the rest of us, so the hap, haplorines, that includes tarsiers, new world monkeys, old world monkeys, and apes. Now I put apes and humans, but humans are apes. I just put and humans, so just for clarification. But sometimes I might just say apes and just know that that includes us. Humans are an ape. Okay, so we're gonna talk about these haplorines. Okay, the haplorines, I'm sorry. So we tend to have, we tend to be larger. Um, so think of like a human or a baboon, like compared to like a, you know, a lemur or a loris that were bigger. We tend to be diurnal, which means we are awake during the day. So think of yourself, you know, we tend to be awake. There's like a couple exceptions to that, but haplorines tend to be 99% of the time we are awake during the day, we're diurnal. Similar molars and mandible, that's like not really that important. I mean, it's important, but I'm not gonna like ask you a major exam question on that. Oh my God, sorry. Okay, slide 28, more pictures of the Tars here. So cute, tiny, like this picture, I don't really like to pick, like this thing is like, Google, they're so tiny, you can Google it. In fact, there is a, I was gonna post something about this for in an announcement. So normally I show this one particular video when I teach this class and um, I might not have access to that video now. I might show you a different one for the primate section. Oh my God, my computer is like, give me one second there. Okay, <sighs> too many things going wrong. Um, the, so I'm kind of going back and forth on which one I'm gonna show you because I know in the syllabus I said I was gonna show you the, the one that's narrated, narrated by Oprah Winfrey. It's a really good one. It's called Primates. But I'm thinking of changing it anyway, like this is so unimportant right now. But there, the point of this is there's one on the Tarsier that I'm thinking about showing you. It's called the Littlest Alien, I think is what it's called. And it's really good, but you can see like they're so tiny and cute. Um, but like I said, when you, when you look at that, you're like, that looks more similar to a lemur and loris. But just know as a cletus, we would say like, they have more traits, actually kind of group them with the rest of us, uh, the rest of us primates. Okay, so number slide 29, New World Monkeys. And and if you're wondering like why are they called New World, it's literally these are the these are the primates that are native to um, North and South America. Now what we know is like naturally, um, besides humans obviously, some naturally live in North America, that for other primates, New World Monkeys, they are native to um, Central, I am blanking, Central and South America. And so looking at this list, you can see that what are the features that new world monkeys tend to share? They tend to be arboreal. What does that mean? They tend to live in the, tr in the trees. Um, but if you think about the, 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 the environment of Central and South America, you're like, there are a lot of trees. It makes sense that that's where they live, right? Um, they tend to be diurnal. And I have owl monkey, that that's the exception. Um, owl monkeys are nocturnal, so. There's always an exception, right? They tend to be small, smaller sized. So imagine if you live in the trees, why might it be better for you to be, especially in high tree, like high branches, why might it be better for you to be small? Well, you probably move a little faster. You cannot break branches and die from the fall if you're smaller, right? So being small, it you know, makes sense. Um, some of them have what's called a prehensile tail. So in cartoons, this is often made to look like they're swinging from their tail. That's not really how it works. But their tail is can be used as like a fifth limb for balance. So you might see um, a, a monkey who has a prehensile tail, like gripping a branch with the tail and maybe with one hand and then using another hand to like reach for fruit. So they use it as like a fifth limb for balance. And um, we see that with New World monkeys, it makes sense that they need a little extra balance if they're living in the trees all the time. And they also have what's called a platyrine nose. So you can see here in the capuchin monkey, it's um, 
a good uh, example of that. So the septum, so that space between the nostrils is very wide and their nostrils point laterally or to the sides. So see that in the capuchin monkey. Go to slide 30, you'll see some examples of new world monkeys. Capuchin, howler, um, emperor tamarin with the, it's the mustache right here. The sake looking so upset. <laughs> Uh, very cute. I've seen one of these before at a zoo. At a zoo, and then the spider monkey showing us that prehensile tail. Very cute. Okay, go to slide thirty-one. Old world monkeys. So old world monkeys are monkeys who are native to Africa and Asia. Um, these are mostly terrestrial, so they tend to live on the ground. If you think about the environment. It tends to be a lot of open spaces, you know, savannas, stuff like that. So it makes sense that most of them live on the ground. Um, some are arboreal. There is obviously there, there are trees in Africa and Asia. It just depends on like which one and where and all that, you know. Um, they are, they, we tend to see more, well, they have sexually dimorphic here. All primates tend to be, there are a few primate species that are not sexually dimorphic, obviously. Um, but many are and i put it under here under older world monkeys i think to reference the fact that when we see sexual dimorphism in old world monkeys we tend to see more in like size we see it in new world monkeys but it tends to be more with color but we see color like you can't really make a claim like there's one more show over the other oh. And then old world monkeys have this thing called bilophodont molars. And here's a picture. It's not a very good, it's like two dimensional picture. Obviously, if we were in the lab, um, which if you take the lab with us, you hopefully will be able to see. Basically, it's just the cusp pattern on the molars is very distinct looking. So that's it. Um, and then if you go to slide 32, you'll see some examples. I, I just want to tell you, I'm never going to ask, I'm never going to put a picture and be like, identify this animal. Like, no. Um, but in general, I might ask you things about coloring, like describe the purpose of sexual dimorphism and coloring. Like, I don't, I don't know. I'm just making shit up right now as I'm talking, but don't ever worry about like, the point is don't ever worry about like identification. Um, okay. So you can see here, we've got a baboon and a guanon. I'm like quizzing myself right now. Uh, colobus monkey and a langer, langer on the one on the far right, very cool. Um, and now go to slide 33, apes. That includes us, we're apes. How do you tell the difference between an ape and a monkey? Tail, no tail, tail, no tail, it's so easy. Um, we, and the other things we tend to be bigger, um, but apes do not have tails, monkeys have tails. So think of all the apes, humans, no tail. Chimpanzees, no tail. Gorillas, no tail. Gibbons, no tail. Orangutans, no tail. Bonobos, no tail. No tail. Um, we have a catarine nose. So you can see that picture here with the human and the chimpanzee. Our septum is very small. Why am I blanking on the word? Not small. Narrow. Narrow. Oh my God. Um, and our nostrils point downward. So you can see that with the human and the chimp. Like I said, our bodies tend to be a bit bigger and wider. So, and go to slide 34, and you can literally, we can put all the currently existing apes on one PowerPoint slide. The other ones, old world monkeys, new world monkeys, there are like so many. I wouldn't be able to put them all on one slide, not even close, not even like 10 slides. There'd be so many, so many. Um, but apes, now there was a time millions of years ago um, where apes were everywhere and there were so many we couldn't even possibly begin to count them. But over time, you know, because things change and animals die out, species die out, lineages, you know, don't continue to evolve. Now we have more, way more monkeys than we have apes. And um, like I said, we could put them all, they're all here on one PowerPoint slide, not even squished either. So we got bonobo, gibbon, human, chimp, orangutan, gorilla. All the currently existing apes are all on one slide. Okay. So what did I do? 50, oh, 54 minutes, I talked for a while, guys, okay. I might take a nap and then try to record the other one for you guys, I know this is a little late. Once again, thank you for those of you who reached out, and even those few you did, I know you guys are all, probably saw my announcement and, and uh, 
you guys are all very understanding. I try to be understanding with you. I know you tried to be understanding with me. Life happens, you know, we're all adults and sometimes life gets hectic, we get sick, blah, blah, blah. You guys all know and understand that. So even hopefully you guys weren't like super excited on Wednesday afternoon to watch a lecture and I wasn't there for you, but it's Thursday afternoon right now, morning. It's like 11. Um, so I'll get this posted and hopefully maybe after I eat a little lunch and maybe take a nap, I'll do the other one if I have energy. I'm, I can't imagine it, 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 the second one, the primate anatomy one wouldn't be up by like tomorrow, but I'll try to get it up today. I hate, I hate getting behind even though I don't feel good. You guys know what that's like. Like you're like, oh, you have a reason, you have an excuse. You're like, I don't feel good. But then you're like, but I, I gotta fit like four days worth of work into one and it's just a nightmare, so. Okay, guys, um, I will, s is there anything else I need to say for the, um, the majority of you guys turn in the exams? I had a couple that were one or two days late, but I think I got emails from you guys. I started grading those, you know, hopefully I'll get them done by the weekend. Um, that's pretty much it. You guys seem to be on the ball with pretty much everything. You got, I think you have a... Uh, an article review coming up like next week or something. I'll probably I'll probably give you another reminder that's closer to the due date. But okay, anyway, um, that's it, and I'll I'll see you guys in the next one.